welcome everyone to our fifth research overture in the series. Um, this research overture is a regular series that we hold to introduce you to new research topics that are being developed at Future Cities Lab. Uh, today, we'll be hearing more about mycelium digitalization, digital fabrication of fungi-based materials for sustainable construction economy. Today, we have with us our presenters who are the co-investigators of Urban Biocycles module at FCL Global. There's Dr. Hortense Leferrand, um, Assistant Professor at the School of Material Science and Engineering and the School of Mechanical and Aerospace Engineering at NTU in Singapore. And from Zurich, we're joined by um, Dr. Juni Lee, who is a senior researcher at Block Research Group at ETH Zurich, and Dr. Anna Zappo, who is a postdoc at the Digital, Digital Building Technologies Group in ETH Zurich. So uh, welcome Hortense, Juni, Anna. And uh, before we begin, I just want to remind everyone here that to mute your microphones when the speakers are presenting, uh, but feel free to post your questions in the chat box uh, here in Zoom as we go along in the presentation. At the end of the presentation, we'll allow you to unmute yourself and ask your questions yourself. Uh, but for now, I think we can dive right in. Hortense, Juni, and Anna, the floor is yours. Okay, so let me share uh, the slides. So hi, everybody. I'm delighted to introduce to you this uh, very exciting module. So my name is Hortense and I'm the coordinator for this module from the Singapore side. And today in uh, 30, 40 minutes, you will hear how we plan to arrange and to conduct this module, both from Singapore and from Zurich side. So what is it that we are trying to do? Uh, so here we have a big challenge uh, that we would like to solve, which is the non-sustainability of the building industry. So to give you some concrete numbers that we got from the UN Environmental Global Status Report in 2017, we, um, like the building industry produces 50% of waste. It also causes 23% of air pollution, 40% of water pollution, and uh, the building industry also exploits critical resources, for example, sand that is used to make cement. The building industry also contributes largely to CO2 emissions. So for example, just by using uh, building materials and the construction, it uh, produces 11% of uh, CO2 emissions of the entire building industry. So clearly there is something that uh, should be done to help solve all this pollution problem. And um, what, what could we do to address this issue? So first we could address the material resources and have a sustainable source of material. So instead of just digging into the soil and getting our resources, maybe we could use resources, grow the resources, and then after it's used, put it back into the environment. Also, we could use processing methods that generate less amount of waste. We could avoid pollution due to transportation by building uh, locally using local resources. And what we would like to do is be able to do all this without compromising the requirements that are needed for buildings. So of course, there are already solutions out there but what we think is that although they are very interesting, they usually address only part of the problem. So here I just highlight two of current solutions. One is provided, uh, proposed by urban trainers uh, who are building modular structures, uh, as you can see here from containers, uh, which is a great way to use already available resources. So we already have these uh, containers, but it's uh, trying to 
uh, extend the lifetime of these containers by putting them and using them into buildings, but also extend the lifetimes of the buildings by, uh, for example, you can change how these containers are assembled to have different uses uh, in, in the buildings. Another solution is provided as well by Studio Lab in uh, Hong Kong, where they use timber to create such a very kind, very nice kiosk. But as we know, timber and wood in general uh, has also quite a large carbon footprint. So it's maybe a solution at the short term, but if we want to address long-term sustainability of building industry, timber uh, may not be the best resource. So what we like to do with this module is to integrate the building industry into a sustainable circular loop. So what we propose is to use mycelium bound composites that are grown from fungi and use it as a resource for building uh, infrastructures. So why do we think it's very interesting? So first, because these kind of composites can grow using natural waste-based resources. So instead of using uh, uh, like a virgin resource like uh, trees or plants, it can actually be uh, use waste materials from the agricultural and agronomic sectors. Second very interesting point here is that it is actually a material that is literally grown. So you grow the fungus onto this waste. And then from this, you can get the material that is uh, interesting for our application. And combined with this sustainable resource, we plan to use additive and subtractive digital method that will also reduce the use, uh, reduce the generation of, of waste. So why do we choose to work with this material and why are we so excited is because there has been research previously done at Singapore ETH Center um, under the direction of Prof. Dirk Hebel that already demonstrated the potential of this material. So the picture that you can see below are mycelium bricks that were produced at uh, Singapore ETH Center. And what they found is that these bricks uh, could be also assembled into structure like this uh, so-called micro tree, uh, which is entirely made of mycelium material and arranged together with uh, bamboo composites. So with this uh, preliminary research, we thought that this material is quite interesting. It is scalable and it has compressive properties that can be leveraged on into a more large scale uh, structures. So our plan to achieve uh, this module is to build this multidisciplinary team that we have now, uh, which is composed of architects from essentially from ETH and KIT. So we have these groups of people, but also we have scientists, so myself on the materials side, also from KIT, uh, Dr. Nazanin, uh, more on the biological side, and we have also engineers who are helping uh, achieve our goals. Then we have divided the research into four key work packages. Um, so the first work package is on the determination, selection, and cultivation of these mycelium-based materials to use. And this first work package will be carried at, uh, so KIT in Germany, SEC in Singapore, and NTU in Singapore. The second work package would be exploring substructive processes to realize structural components out of mycelium. This will be done at ETH uh, Zurich. The third work package will explore digital uh, processes using 3D printing methods. And these will be done at ETH and at NTU, so Zurich side and Singapore side. And finally, in the fourth work package, all 
contributors, all researchers will uh, have inputs and collaborate together to really provide an assessment on how this method and this material that we are researching and developing are suitable real to, uh, to the construction sector. So this is the global picture. So this was a challenge. What are the key ideas? Who is gonna be doing the work? How we divide the work into a structured manner? And so now we're gonna give you some more details input on what we plan to do on these uh, specific work packages. So let me continue now on the first work package. So which is about the determination, selection and cultivation of this mycelium bound uh, materials. So here the objective is to be able to supply a large amount of mycelium for the digital manufacturing. So we are aiming to the construction industry. So we need to make sure that whatever uh, material that we can produce, we need to make sure that it is scalable uh, to the construction sector. And then the second objective is to ensure that the mycelium that is supplied can provide the properties that are also required for the processes and for the target application. So the specific research questions that we address are, for example, which fungal species would lead to the most sustainable growth? So by this, we have to ask ourselves, can it grow quickly? Can it grow without having contaminations, without uh, having stringent requirements for its, its growth? Like can it grow in air, like normal air, without need for a specialized, sterilized environment? Second research question is, which fungal species would lead the most suitable composite properties? So some fungi leads to very good mechanical properties, some fungi have very good uh, surface properties like hydrophobicity, for example. And then finally, one key research question is, can we make use of local resources to integrate into the local economy? Remember what we would like to do is to take local waste and then use it as our substrate, grow our fungi on it, and then input it into the um, process locally to build the material locally. So ideally, we would like to have one circle loop based in, for example, Zurich area and one circle loop based in the Singapore area. So these might uh, use different local resources. They might use different fungi as well. Um, so we need to make sure that uh, whatever mycelium is produced at the, at the substrate level would be the best. So to do this, uh, so we have uh, the uh, chance to have the team from KIT, which is also extended uh, between uh, ETH and Zurich and Singapore, sorry. So we have researchers um, from KIT who will come to the Singapore ETH Center to conduct this research in collaboration with me at NTU and my researcher here, uh, Eugene So. And then from KIT, uh, Dr. Nazanin and Dr. Um, uh, Ali Reza would work very closely to ETH to make sure that they provide the right material for them. Now, I've been talking a lot about these mycelium bond composites, but maybe you, <laughs> your question is, what is it actually? How does it look like? So here, I just want to give you the very basics on, on these materials. So we know Fungi, right? What we know from fungi are the mushrooms. So what you see here on this picture, this mushroom that we eat, these are the foods of the fungi. Now, when, if for example, if you if you buy this pack to grow your own uh, uh, mushrooms uh, to eat, uh, it's fun. You should do it. But what is is interesting is what happens in the box. So the box here is filled with a substrate. And in this substrate, you have something that looks white, and this is the mycelium. And we are not interested in growing the fungus, uh, in growing the fruits and the, mush and the mushrooms. What we're interested in is in what we don't see, 
which is the mycelium. To see it, you can grow it on a transparent substrate like this agar plate. And this white fluffy thing, this is what is the mycelium. If we take this mycelium and look at it under an, uh, an electron microscope, it looks like this. So it's a very branched structure with very fine uh, threads. So there is no scale bar here, but the, the thickness or the diameter of this thread is roughly three to five micrometer. Okay, so it's a very microscopic structure and uh, very interconnected. And uh, these schematics here that uh, were found in, in this nice paper scientific reports um, show that actually each of these threads, which are called hyphae, you have the cells of the fungi. And in these cells, uh, the wall of these cells is composed of chitin, cellulose, and protein. The reason I highlight the components is because cellulose, you know, this is the most, the main component of wood. Chitin is the main component of shrimps. And then protein is binding everything to make it very strong. But chitin and cellulose, they are very interesting because they are known to be very, very strong mechanically. And they are also known to be very hydrophobic. And so this studying what is a component in terms of chitin, protein, and cellulose is very interesting if we want to know which mycelium is the strongest, for example. So when we grow this fungi onto a substrate and produce a mycelium bond composite, this is how it looks like. We have substrate material, which usually are particulates. So you can see here, this is a, a, a substrate particle. This is another one. This is another one. And after three to four weeks of growth, the mycelium, which is this net, binds everything together so that your substrate that was initially just particles uh, together, now they are bound together into a composite. OK, so this is. Uh, what we are looking at, what, it, what we are developing. Now, there are many factors that affect the growth of this uh, mycelium. We have the substrate size, the composition, temperature, humidity, light, light, age, species, and so on. So this, we need to look at it. And uh, there are also many types of substrate that we can use. What we know is that it needs to be lignocellulosic, so it needs to have some wood or um, a plant-based components, it needs to have some sugar. So the cellulose is actually a sugar and it needs to have some nitrogen to allow the, the mycelium to grow. Now we are growing it at different scales. For example, SEC and KIT can grow these mycelium composites at medium scale. So here we are talking about bricks that uh, are maybe uh, 40 centimeters. At NTU, we are looking at more, much smaller scale because we carry out, uh, for example, these SEM pictures you showed before or other types of optimization. So here we are really using 50 or 10 grams so we can screen also a larger amount of parameters. But although we can do it in smaller scale, we know for sure it can be scaled up. This is a picture from Mushroom Farm in Thailand where they grow it at a much larger scale. So here they grow it for the mushrooms for food but actually they have also the bags. And so they have everything required to make these mycelium composites um, in this, uh, grown in, in a larger scale. So we have done preliminary results to look at the optimization for the growth. We need to make sure that we can grow a lot of it. So here in a very recent work that should come out uh, closely uh, soon, we have looked at a way to make it grow independently on the quality of the substrate, on the quality of the spawn that we used. So for example, if we put a little bit more of food supplements, we can make it grow. So if we don't put anything, it doesn't grow. And if we put a little bit of food specimen or food supplement, even if the mycelium and the substrate are not the best, we can make it grow. So the action plan now is to make sure we optimize substrate and growth condition irrespective if it's Singapore or Zurich. We want to make sure we find the best fungus 
make sure that we have a reliable, sustainable source of substrate locally, and then be able to provide um, material uh, to be used in the subsequent uh, work packages. So now this leads me to the next um, work package. And here I will hand over to uh, Dr. Juni. So I will stop sharing so that uh, you guys can take over. Yeah, hello, we're back. Hello, so my name is Juni, um, and in work package two, uh, we'll be looking at now if this mycelium components are already grown and process, somewhat processed. Uh, our particular focus will be on how to use these pre processed and pre grown mycelium components and then uh, determine what kind of types of architecture applications that they'll be um, suitable for. So uh, for us, our expertise is in structural design uh, using um, alternative and more sustainable materials. But we also know that these um, alternative materials uh, and sustainable materials tend to be much weaker than the materials that we tend to use for structures like steel or concrete. So they specifically require a very um, intelligent geometry, the so structural shape of the structures. So that will also be combined with um, this mycelium research to determine what kind of shapes, forms, and topologies of structures uh, make most sense with these mycelium components. And we'll also be looking specifically at uh, subtractive digital fabrication methods. I think uh, one um, long-term promise of this research we see is that uh, subtractive digital fabrication methods usually have a lot of byways, meaning that whatever gets subtracted usually tends to be wasted or it's hard to recycle. But in our case, I think we'll try to uh, investigate whether this by waste uh, of this subtractive method can also be used to feed back into the loop as a recycled uh, substrate or component to do the next batch of uh, mycelium um, production. So our key research questions are uh, to understand the structural behavior and capacity of these compressed mycelium components. Uh, and what kind of appropriate fabrication and assembly strategies make sense for these um, more compressed uh, pre-processed mycelium components and how can they be used uh, for structural applications at an architecture scale. So this research uh, work package two will be led by uh, Professor Block at the Block Research Group at ETH Zurich and uh, the full-time researchers will be myself and Selena who's our uh, uh, PhD student. So by compressed mycelium boards, we're talking about uh, something maybe slightly different than uh, maybe some mycelium research that you may have seen before. So whereas uh, a lot of the these more spongy, blocky looking mycelium samples are uh, grown materials inside of a mold, typically, uh, these composite panels that, uh, not composite, but compressed um, panels that we're talking about is uh, these grown mycelium samples that have some sort of um, pressure or compression applied to them so that they become much denser and as a, a result gain a more structural integrity with which we can work to explore other means of uh, using this material. So as mentioned before, this material is much weaker than the materials that we're um, very much familiar with. So it will need a uh, very specific uh, investigation in appropriate form finding. And by that, I mean uh, where to put this material such that they are acting primarily in compression only because it's spending and tensile uh, strength is quite low. So this investigation in the appropriate form finding methods will help us uh, guide um, not just the shape, but also where to put these materials. And because these uh, components will be compressed, it either means that they'll most likely be flatter uh, will have flatter aspect ratio as in like more of a sheet material or flatter blocks, which will require its uh, own set of specific joinery techniques. And what does it mean if we create these uh, joints and cut the, cut the specimen? What does it mean in terms of the exposed surfaces and how they join um, using um, similar mycelium-based binders and so on and so on. And also, uh, 
Subtractive fabrication methods, uh, CNC milling or wire cutting will also uh, be used appropriately depending on what types of uh, structural typology that uh, we um, set to explore. So here's just some example of uh, what we mean by CNC milling. So CNC milling would be taking this compressed sample and using a mill to uh, cut out a shape or patterns or these joints to um, assemble the pieces together or wire cutting for a case where uh, if the blocks or the compressed samples can be more uh, volumetric rather than a sheet with which we can then create these uh, more complex uh, block geometries with which we can assemble uh, into a larger structure. And these are just examples of what uh, previous uh, work has shown um, what is possible using these, uh, let's say, already produce or process mycelium components. So on the left, we see a uh, structure that is a um, accumulation of these mycelium blocks or bricks. But we also see potential in uh, composite panels as well. So if this com compressed mycelium panels have some sort of uh, structural uh, integrity and advantage, what happens if we combine it with other materials and sandwich them together to even uh, further enhance its structural capacity? And there are other products as well in the market that we also would like to investigate to see how certain applications of these materials achieved. So for example, like floor tiles, uh, what does it mean in terms of uh, waterproofing the material uh, and treating it such that it can actually be used at an architecture scale? So our action plan currently is to uh, yeah, get our hands uh, dirty or uh, clean in our case, I guess. Uh, investigate the relationship between uh, the amount of compression that we put onto this material and what does it mean in terms of its resulting uh, structural capacity and behavior and identify uh, uh, feasible scale and typology and applications of this material because we also understand that if we are compressing this material uh, we're ultimately limited by the size uh, footprint of this material which means that the eventual structure we build have to be uh, discretized in a very intelligent way then we also like to, uh, depending on those structural typologies, start thinking about what kind of uh, appropriate uh, uh, fabrication methods make sense. Um, yeah, and then also as soon as we have some uh, uh, flow of material that we can uh, experiment with, uh, immediately start prototyping and testing the material to uh, really understand uh, its uh, behavior and potential. Um. And then we are off to work package three, which is about exploring additive methods to create architecture elements with mycelium. So there we have two strands uh, led by two PIs. So uh, Professor Le Perand uh, on the Singapore side with a, a postdoc, which is still to be hired in Eugene so, and Benjamin Dillenberger at ETH where we are the team with Tiziano Derma and, and myself, Anna Sabo. So our objectives is to use additive manufacturing methods to, to, uh, to produce a SAF supporting mycelium structure and to provide architecture scale elements that could have optimized geometries and uh, gain relevance and, and function in our field. So our research questions are the following. Uh, on the extrusion side done at Singapore, the question is if we can develop an ink-like paste that uh, could be suitable for the process, so it could flow, could be extruded and could provide a structure that is buildable. And, uh, if, uh, and on our side, uh, from a powder bed based processing, we, we have the question if we can deposit a substrate and locally consolidate it and achieve various forms with it. So uh, the resolution and the shapes are question for, for both uh, fabrication methods, both extrusion printing and powder pad printing. And uh, ultimately, we are also trying to investigate if uh, the elements and their aggregations could gain relevance for architecture. So these are the two strands. So as I mentioned in Singapore, uh, the extrusion-based uh, 3D printing is, is explored now with, a, with an initial setup where they use uh, bamboo fibers and, and kitozan uh, to grow the mycelium on. 
And we at, at ETH, we uh, plan to set up a powder bed based 3D printing where where we have a powder bed, which is the substrate that we deposit layer by layer. And we use two different kinds of inks where we define geometries. One could be a, a liquid mycelium culture and another one, which could inhibit the, the growth of mycelium so that we can really define these geometries. The, the process is also called, also called binder jetting. So here, uh, what we have to also point down that um, the the binding will happen over time with the mycelium. So this activation happens during the process and then we need to wait. Uh, so the extrusion based 3D printing is, is currently uh, investigated at, at the Singapore University. It has uh, references in cement printing or with other materials uh, in material science, they usually call it direct ink writing. And uh, at different stages of the process, there are different um, requirements. So these, these can be also tested with uh, lab equipment. In general, the in general, the material needs to be uh, shear thinning. So when when uh, we we uh, compress the material in these syringes, then it should be able to flow out. Uh, this is already uh, very hard to hard to achieve. Here we can see on the right a reference for shear thinning materials, uh, for example, the toothpaste. Uh, but we also have to think about that it's not only extrudability that that we have as a as a requirement, but also after extrusion, this liquid material uh, should be shape retaining and it should also uh, develop a strength so that we can build uh, consequent layers on top. And um, the, the question is uh, where we inoculate the material uh, at which point and uh, how we grow the, the mushroom in the system. So if, if, it, has, if it is added uh, for the ink or if it is uh, added after printing. Uh, these are some initial tests that, that were uh, recently published in, in a paper. Uh, I It's it's not it's, uh, yeah I will I will go to uh, the action plan here so it's initially the the uh, the main requirement is is extrudability so to optimize an in uh, composition that could um, enhance the growth of mycelium in it uh, then uh, in order to have the extrudability. Uh, the, the mix needs to be uh, also flowable and afterwards afterwards it should build up strength so that uh, structures could be uh, built from it layer by layer. The, uh, the growth is, is also influenced by, by contact points and, and these uh, extruded uh, filaments. So the structural the structural properties could also be influenced by how the uh, these extruded strands are laid down and this will also be investigated and and obviously the material uh, will be characterized uh, as for the mechanical properties uh, which will be mainly defined by also uh, the growth and the connection points between the substrate and the mycelium so our uh, at, at eth side we will investigate powder bed printing there uh, are the principle that we conduct this research on is that we would like to control the growth of mycelium in this digital fabrication process where we have uh, the powder as the substrate which is for example sawdust we have a binder which grows over time which is the mycelium and we have two different types of inks one is an activator and the other one is an anti-activator so uh, as an activator for the substrate, we could use, for example, a mycelium culture and as an anti-ink, we would like to investigate growth inhibitors, uh, which could be a, an additional solution that we place in this bed. So we can see a, a printer on the right, which is an in-house printer at DBT, uh, developed by one of the researchers that we could use for our investigation. And, and uh, we are planning to conduct some experiments with those. Um, and 
on the diagram in the bottom, we can see the principle of the process. So we are uh, building up a structure layer by layer. It, the, the geometries could be sub, uh, supported by the material around, so we can achieve complex geometries. And uh, then after production, we would need to wait to the, the mycelium grows. And we are also thinking about uh, steps as post-production uh, to apply, apply heat and pressure to the, to the printed um, volume and uh, achieve better properties through increasing the density and the bonds in the mycelium. I put here two reference projects, which, uh, which are dealing with the granular materials and digital fabrication with them, which uh, we could also uh, think about uh, in the powder bed based uh, processing. So on the left, we can see a material jamming pro project by Petrus Lindström, where um, aggregates are laid and compacted, uh, and then subsequently um, a circular pattern, pattern string is laid on top. And um, this, this method is repeated layer by layer. And it uses the friction between the aggregates and the tension in the string to, to achieve certain forms. The interesting thing here is why we uh, keep it as a reference is this, this process deals with granular matter but doesn't need any uh, box around, so no confinement. Uh, it would require a robotic arm for, for our experiments and, and that's also uh, a possible piece of equipment that we could use. On the right, it's, it's a project by Daniela Mittenberger and, and Tiziano Derme, who's the PhD student on the project, which was called Magic Queen from the last Venice Biennale, where um, soil is, is laid layer by layer. Here, there's a box around and there's an organic binder uh, with which uh, the soil is, is fixed. And, uh, and then uh, with the robotic arm, it is just injected into, into the loose soil. The soil is compacted at each step, and uh, later, as as uh, the finishing step, the the boxes around are removed, and the a loose soil is also removed from the system. So currently, we are uh, thinking about uh, uh, basically figuring out how to do this powder bed uh, printing and and set up the the experimental environment for it. Uh, what we would like to have at ETH is uh, what we plan to have is a, is a clean room to be able to provide the environmental conditions in which the mycelium could be grown. So we need to control the humidity and the temperature at least, and we, we would like to have a sterile room um, first. And, uh, and we, we can imagine to, to either place a robotic arm or uh, a printer inside with which we could uh, conduct the first uh, smaller scale tests. Uh, with substrates and, and uh, uh, feedstock and also mycelium species that, that we identified together with, with KIT. So then that leads to the action plan. So uh, first uh, we, we will also all together go to KIT and, and do a study trip uh, where we also imagine to learn more about the, the substrates and, and strains uh, that we could start to, to experiment with. We will together define an inoculation strategy where to activate this and uh, for our for our small scale test that I just mentioned. Uh, what would be very uh, interesting to test uh, at this point is the enhancement of growth and the inhibition of growth, which would provide us with uh, the the option to uh, to produce volumetric pieces where um, there are certain areas where the mushroom grows and and other places where it doesn't. Um, we will also investigate deposition and compaction methods for a specific substrate that we identified uh, before. And uh, as I said, it can also happen the compaction um, after the, the printing process. So we could also imagine applying pressure and, and uh, trying to improve properties by that. And we will also use the in-house equipment uh, also for um, building components, but also for characterization of the printed material. And then as, as a final goal, we would like to do functional elements and, and optimize designs with the fabrication process that we identify. 
Thanks, Anna. And then for the final work package four, um, this will be done by all the research um, teams. So it's less scientific, but also I think uh, you could argue that it's about the most important because you will assess whether all of this research is really uh, has real uh, real world impact and how does that uh, how might that work? So this has a lot to do with how uh, the true uh, real life cycle assessment of all these processes are and what the social impact of that uh, is uh, long term and short term as well. And in terms of how to actually push these uh, new innovation and technologies into the industry, what does that mean in terms of the steps that we need to take, the hurdles we need to uh, go over? Um, and I think a lot of this research uh, will need to in thoroughly investigate its um, real uh, world impact and influence in terms of waste. What does it mean in terms of uh, growth and uh, the resource that might require to have this uh, technology be impactful at a larger scale? Uh, a lot of benchmarking and structural properties and comparing them to existing uh, building codes, for example, and standards of construction. And I think most importantly, also, uh, if these uh, new ways of building um, architecture uh, really does uh, go forward, what does that mean in terms of uh, its impact on like social acceptance, for example, and on um, from both the public and private sectors? Um, so that was a uh, summary of the uh, our research module uh, in digitalization of mycelium. Um, yeah, I think we're ready to take questions. Right? Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thanks, uh, Junie, Anna, Hortens. Um, so uh, feel free to post your question in the chat box. And while you do that, I um, maybe I just uh, kick off uh, with a couple of questions that emerged in my mind when you were presenting. Juni, specifically, when you were showing those images of the tiles and things, are, are is mycelium-based uh, building material already commercialized or available uh, somewhere? And in addition to the the tiling, and there was an insulation application that uh, I saw. There could there's other applications of the compression that use the compression strength, or are there some preliminary ideas you have in mind for those applications? Um, yeah, I mean, we're just beginning to uh, research into the, uh, like the state of the art to see which applications have used this particular technique of compressing the mycelium my components. Um, we, and those were just some, some of the few examples that we've seen in, uh, in application of small scale like tiles or acoustic panels or insulation panels. Uh, but I think the team at KIT is also developing this. So in terms of, uh, I, th I think it's actually really at the forefront of its um, area of research. So uh, we'll, uh, we're actually visiting the lab at KIT in a few weeks. And I think then we'll learn a lot more about what how this process actually works, and what the team there is actually specifically investigating in terms of yeah, the relationship between the compression, how is this compression applied, when is it applied, uh, is it done in combination with temperature and uh, so on and so on uh, to see what we can actually achieve with this uh, process. So it's really uh, literally uncharted territory sort of. Yeah, I, I think so as well, because I think there's so much, so much of the, uh, or at least the architectural application of my scene components had tend to be in this uh, growing. It's very much focused on growing. But I think in this, in our particular work package, we're really interested in Okay, if it's already grown and we controlled it, control the growth and compress it into a uh, uh, stable and kind of uh, consistent uh, stock of material, what can we do with it? So I think it's something very new and I think very exciting for us. Yeah. Uh, Quentin has a question about modifying the fungi genetically. Quentin, would you like to unmute yourself and ask the question yourself? Yeah, sure. Can you hear me? Yeah. Um, so, um, looking at your presentation, thank you, by the way, it's uh, very interesting. Um, I, uh, I saw the drilling patterns that you showed. Some of them uh, showed a lot of explosion of the material, since it's granular, I guess. And I was thinking how to make it uh, stick or increase the cohesion between the different um, granules. 
And uh, did you consider modifying the fungi? Because since you already compressed the brick, I'm not sure what happens to the cells, but probably they explode and release whatever uh, everything they did inside. And if you would fill the cells with uh, extra leg and many proteins they can attach to different types of substrates, um, maybe this would release extra leg and that at the moment you compress and increase the cohesion of the material. Therefore, maybe simplifying the next steps uh, like drilling. Uh, yeah, I think it's a great uh, advice. Actually, I think this is certainly something that we'll investigate uh, because, yeah, I, I think it also means that uh, if these compressed uh, mycelium components are dead, let's say, mycelium, then it will really, I think, be almost it's the same as if you would just uh, CNC mill uh, like a MDF wood board or OSB board. So I think if we really want to know uh, how we want to treat, treat these, these milled surfaces or things like that, and we want an extra layer of maybe growth afterwards, and I, I guess uh, yeah, these types of process will be, have to be taken into account um, at a very specific juncture in this production. So maybe instead of compressing and totally killing the, uh, the substrates or uh, cells, Maybe yeah, the milling could happen some, somewhere in between as well. So um, yeah, these are all just uh, open questions that we're uh, very excited to address. If I may just chip in on this, because I really like the question. I was thinking of it myself, uh, maybe not, not, not exactly for the compression, but you know, the, the fungi to grow on the substrate, it has to secrete some enzymes, right? To break down the substrate and digest it. And actually, before it secretes these enzymes, it also secretes some proteins that are, um, you know, amphiphilic, and that have specific binding bonding properties to the substrates. So, and so I think um, engineering the like bioengineering the fungi <laughs> or modifying whatever protein they would express, for example, more of these binding proteins would be indeed uh, extremely interesting. So I think you're, you're bringing up a very interesting question here. Thank you. I see Sasha raising her hand. Sasha, would you like to unmute yourself? Yeah, thank you very much for this really interesting um, conversation and um, presentation. And I'm, I'm wondering, you started at the beginning with a let's say kind of comparison that uh, so the building industry is running into the wrong direction, which I absolutely agree with you. And we have to look and seek for new methodologies for new processes. And one of yours, I think is, is, is really interesting is this self-growing idea of this uh, fungus or fungi. And my, my question is, so do you still compare your fungus growing and then at the end being used for the building industry. So in comparison to other building materials, there is uh, big questions about cement at the moment. I'm sure Philip is uh, really involved within all that, the consumption of water, the fungus needs water to grow. I think this would be interesting to know. You don't have to answer this now but it's just a kind of a little concern to make it more valuable to make it stronger what you are doing that you are better than others when you look at the farming one knows that to grow a kilo of salmon needs one third of the water than growing uh, one third of a, of a cow right a kilo of a cow and so these are questions which nowadays are quite relevant Yeah, I think this is exactly what we are trying to, what we will address in our fourth work package, to really compare and quantify what is required to grow a certain amount of uh, this mycelium bond material, what would be the carbon impact, uh, and how, yeah, what would be, how sustainable is the method in comparison to other other available solutions, yeah. That, that's okay for, for me, just keep an eye on it because I think other people will ask you that. So 
at the midterm review, at least. <laughs> okay. I think Stephen is asking the, a similar question. Both the directors have the same uh, direction that they're thinking in. Stephen, would you also like yeah, to unmute I'm yourself asking, and raise asking it? Asking the question sooner than you might think. Uh, it's the same question, really. But I, I was struck by your opening um, comment, Hortense, when you said, when you opened up with the kind of comparison to timber. And um, I'm, I'm just interested in the relative carbon intensity of timber and whether that's associated with industrialization of timber production and therefore mycelium uh, has, has a different kind of system you imagine or is there something much more sort of biological about and, and more sort of chemical about about that claim what's the advantages quite simply of, of mycelium over another biomaterial like timber so here i was just thinking timber you need to to cut the forest right you need to cut a tree and then it takes a long time for this tree to regrow. In the case of mycelium, you don't cut anything. You don't, you don't have to exploit uh, new resources. You don't have to, to grow plants specially for this. You can use already waste that is around. Um, although it has some wood, but there are many industries that produce uh, sawdust, for example. And this sawdust is just, it's just burned. Usually they don't do anything. So there is already waste around that we can just use and exploit to grow the mycelium. And it can be sodas, but it can also be, what was it? Like beer extract, for example, when, when they make beer, apparently there is a lot of waste. They don't do anything with it. So now we could use it actually and boost the growth of the fungi. So the really the difference is that we don't need to grow or another food, another, another resource, we can really use what is already there around us. Mm -hmm. you know, another important thing to mention is that uh, yeah, compared to, I think timber is like a very, uh, like a easy, let's say counter, maybe example to compare these sustainable materials to. But I think the biggest uh, takeaway is that it, uh, mycelium, for example, doesn't require soil which means that you don't need earth to grow the materials. I think that's uh, a, a difference, I would say. Um, and that's, I think, something that could really be taken advantage of. Yeah. Great. I can see, yeah, all, all many consequences follow from that, yeah. that, that, that fork in the road. Yeah, thanks a lot. Kelly Reynolds has a question about the fungal species that you use. Uh, Kelly, would you like to unmute and elaborate on the question? Thank you very much. Um, just interested, are you looking at a, a mixed fungal species or are you looking at a specific species that you're, you're inoculating with or is that part of the work you're actually investigating? Sorry, I haven't put my camera on, but is that part of the work or do you have your, your mycelial culture already? Thank you. So from, from my side, we have like some favorite fungi, <laughs> like this uh, Ganoderma, the Pleurotus. Um, I think from uh, KIT, we look at also different strains. I, I'm not sure about combinations of fungi. Uh, maybe if they can work together. I mean, usually you also have com competition, but... Um, yeah, I think we will probably try to start simple on choosing selected fungi and choosing the best, but this is a very interesting thought. I don't know if the guys from ETH you have anything to add. We are just about to start. <laughs> so we haven't chosen anything yet. But uh, after the study trip, hopefully we will have our favorite as well. Okay. Thanks very much, everybody. Thank you. Um, any last call for questions? If not, I think uh, we are ready to close the session. This is uh, very interesting, and especially compared to the past four um, uh, overtures we've had. We haven't had images at this scale of microscopic levels. It's a refreshing change, but I can see the link between here and the other scales that we are working with and how it gradually connects to each other, especially with your final work package, where you start looking at life cycle assessment, social impact, impact on bioeconomy, which you touched upon, which is a very important factor as well. 
So I'm looking forward to seeing what uh, comes out of your research or future publications. And this uh, recording, uh, this session has been recorded and this will be available on YouTube, um, on our YouTube channel. So if you follow it, you will get a ping. And um, yeah. So thank you for your time, everyone. And uh, thanks, Hortense, um, Anna, and Judy. Thank you. Thank you.